Hello folks, how are you doing? It's Shabash. Welcome back to the channel. It's Orna again. I want to say thanks to everybody who's uh, wished me well during COVID. Thankfully, uh, I've pretty much recovered now. Uh, just waiting to get my taste and smell back. That's uh, not one of the best things, but uh, all good, all good. Managed to do this part two. We've got 49 more tips and tricks for Orna. Part two, let's go. Always use a torch because it's 60 minute buff allows you to see in the dark at night time, but also increases monster spawns and acts as a view distance multiplier. Buy them in shops for pennies. View distance boosts stack together multiplicatively for the most part. One of my favorite utilizations early game is to use two lantern accessories. You can buy these in shops or get them from Mimic Drops or complete the Goblin Lord quest. Then dual wield weapons that give view distance. Draconian scepters from the Draconian Lord boss for mages are perfect. Or fire pikes from Pyre NPC quests for melee. Have that in my world gear loadout in order to scout and to access dungeons from further afield. Then ensure I'm using my good gear in my gauntlet loadout. Always use your boosters when farming. A lucky coin, lucky silver coin, doubles your gold and ores income from killing anything in the world and in dungeons. As long as you're regularly killing bosses, you'll never run out of these. Experience potions are commonly dropped from low tier kingdom raids, uh, mimic type mobs as well, or worst case you can buy an experience potion for 1000 ores in the rune shop. Consumable boosters and shrines and the like do not affect raid rewards in any way. Talking experience potions, lucky silver coins, shrines, etc. Exploration monsters and bosses yield double rewards compared to if they were out in the world. So later on this can be exceptional for farming horns and experience if you've got shrines and temples up. Completing dungeons successfully nets you extra bonus orns, materials, completed quest items and random items. These can also drop in higher qualities. For example, this is the only way to get another band of gods, potentially, or an A. You can adjust the tier of your dungeon using the drop down. This is ideal if you're struggling to complete dungeons at your current tier. It's always best to actually try and complete the dungeons for extra rewards, or if you're hunting down a specific mob or boss. Hard mode dungeons double the reward yield from kills inside. For example, monster rewards go up to 100%, of their world equivalent and boss rewards go up to 50% of their world equivalent. Also gives you more materials and orns at the end as well as making any item drop in the completion screen be of at least superior quality. Talking about the end of dungeon rewards, this is a good way to earn superior famed legendary and even ornate band of gods or nothing crown etc. So you see this boulder bold NPC quest item is of at least superior quality. Status effects on you caused by your pet cannot be immunized against. Perfect example is a Crimson Gazer. I'm going to equip this Ring of Anwin. For example, Ring of Anwin gives you immunity to the four basic status ailments. But we'll see now, Crimson Gazer uses Cataclysm, procking rot on us. Then uses Fulmination, causing Paralyzed, and so on and so forth. Buy low tier cheap items in shops to dismantle them in bulk for useful materials such as wood, iron, hide and leather. Always buy the elemental stone materials. There's 4 NPC quests which require 50 of each type at tier 4 and you'll need them for future item upgrades and enchanting. Check your shops regularly for monster remains, dowsing rods, arena tokens and affinity candles. You can never really have too much of these. Plenty of early and mid game bosses and hard mobs can actually be slept or even stunned. This is commonly the best way to take down powerful enemies and can get you big gear upgrades. Buy the tier 2 rogue class to unlock sleep dart and stun dart if you haven't already. Killing a boss out in the world can have two outcomes. 
Firstly, there's an 80% chance the same boss will respawn in the same spot after 3 hours, or a new boss will spawn randomly nearby instead. You can view and fight bosses up to one tier higher than you out in the world, uh, at least until tier 8. Tier 9 players cannot see tier 10 world bosses. If you manage to take down a higher tier world boss and it drops a weapon, quite often that boss weapon will be better than your current one even without any quality. Chuck a couple of whetstones on it and see if it's an improvement. If you're playing with friends, you can all kill the same world boss or mob as long as everyone enters the fight before someone kills the boss or mob. You will not receive any rewards on world bosses or mobs that you've damaged incrementally unless you deal a killing blow yourself. I'm not talking about world raid bosses here. Grayed out items in shops and similarly spells in arcanists that say unavailable are tier locked, so you'll have to level up to purchase these. The Orna overworld map is augmented using OpenStreetMap. Biomes in the game are depicted from there. Walking around locally and an increased player activity in general can and will cause new buildings to spawn naturally in the world. We're talking random inns, shops, blacksmiths, vestries, even dungeons, pray for that dungeon spawn. I believe different players, characters and also slightly different routes taken can expedite these spawns. Also bear in mind this probably won't work in already congested areas. For example, I remember walking down the canal and one day this dungeon spawned right in front of me. Absolute beauty. I think it was my birthday. NPCs with a yellow question mark above their heads should have new quests available for you to accept, even if you finish their main story quest. Each NPC out in the world has a mini quest line for you to complete available once you reach the relevant tier. And these quests will always be the same, for example, Gillis will first ask you to acquire five monster tombs, these have to be of normal quality. You complete that and then secondly he will ask you to acquire an Ankh. Now any story or NPC quests that require you to hand in an item requires that item to be both unlocked and be of standard quality. So for this Gillis quest you can see from the four Ankhs that I have here it's going to select this one here when we hand it in. Accept and complete the quest, there we go. And once you complete their quest line, NPCs will start offering you random quests to complete. These can be killing mobs of the NPC's tier, or random quests like traveling or defeating arena opponents. So we go back and search for the Ankh again, and you can see the one that was selected was normal quality and unlocked. Buildings with a yellow exclamation mark means they've restocked naturally. For example, all of these shops here, they have restocked. And now the explanation mark has gone away because I've checked it. And similarly for bisteries, also have the yellow exclamation mark to show that they have restocked naturally. So you can tell if a building in Orna is player made, if the name shows apostrophe S to indicate possessions. So at the top here, you can see Shabash's shop, whereas this shop down here, uh, Hill Parkway shop, there is no apostrophe S to indicate possession. This is a random spawned building. This little arrow that's always visible on your screen just points north. That's all it shows. So you can see if you rotate your map, it will always point the same direction. It always points north. You can also double tap your screen uh, to reset the view to north and have north showing upwards on your map.
your first specialization choice per character is free, so I recommend waiting until tier 5, level 100, and choosing a more powerful tier 5 spec, saving you a sweet 25,000 orns, rather than going with a tier 3 spec which don't really give you much benefits. Killing the fallen mobs early on is a great way to accumulate arena tokens in the early game, and also the fallen mage, warrior and thief drop the best starting weapons for each class type. You can change your origin town once every 7 days, and in fact you can take some if not all of your buildings with you. Basically anything built from within your original origin town build menu will come with you, regardless of where they're placed physically. When you reassign a new origin town area, your buildings will magically appear in a random pile, ready for you to place and sort out at your leisure. Use the hidden info spreadsheet available from the Orna Guide website for tons of extra detail into game mechanics and other information. Experience multipliers, booster multipliers, skill information, you've got the M1 which is the penetration value, and then M2s, like a damage multiplier, all the skills, you've got the regional map. Bunch of random good tips there. Use Orna.guide as the best resource Orna game database available. Tons of useful information available here. Always tag all available kingdom raids, by that I mean do at least one point of damage, to get in the loot drop pool. Now higher tier raid gear will not drop for you, but you can regularly receive goodies like gauntlet keys, potions, that kind of thing. Use your highest penetrating skill possible. So early on, this is likely going to be double edge for attack builds, or the level 50 archmage elemental spells are actually pretty good as well. Meteor, blizzard, storm and quake. Try and have Origin Town and Party Bonus active to increase your offensive stats as much as possible. Plus crit chance from gear and battle buffs now affect all skills that can crit. These are most strike attack skills and fey magic spells. However, skills that have specific crit rates in their description cannot have their crit chance changed, for example Guts and Lunge. The following four status effects will cause a 100% guaranteed hit rate, even if you're blinded. These are Frozen, Asleep, Stunned and Petrified. Just remember that this also works against you. Kingdom quests can actually refresh after a few days of nobody starting them, so if there's a painful quest just abandon it and hope for an easier one to pop up. Kingdom Gauntlet fights can be shuffled once per 20 minutes, but not if that fight has already been started. So if you've got a berserk waiting to own you, don't be ashamed to call for a shuffle. Kingdom Gauntlets can be started at a maximum rate of 1 per hour, and the rewards increase with more players in your roster and with a higher level of players. The tier rating of monster kill quests is the same tier as that monster. That should give you an idea of what dungeon tier to select if you're going to use dungeons to try and find the mob. For example, this Lizard Lord is a tier 3 boss, and this Goblin Warrior here are tier 2. All items in the game receive their maximum amount of adornment slots when Master Forged, regardless of their initial quality. For example, Broken and Ornate items will have the same adornment slots at Master Forge level. Except Baylor Crown, by the way, this occurs at Demon Forge for some reason. Additionally, God forging an item in the end game will then also add an additional dormant slot. Small caveat that some offhand items don't get additional slots. Skill elements override your weapon element. You can still actually proc the elemental status effect associated with your weapon though. This will affect attack builds more than magic builds. Using emulators such as Bluestacks to play Orna is actually against terms of service and uh, you'll eventually likely get banned. 
You can however use uh, screen mirroring like Chromecast or Screen Copy. Or Scrippy. Scrippy? Skirt. Skirt. Different sources of boosters stack together multiplicatively. I'm talking about Experience, Orange, and those consumable boosters. So those boosters I just used and these Band of Gods will each multiply the rewards when killing monsters. Choosing a faction at level 10 doesn't really change your gameplay too significantly. I'd say either go with the faction description that resonates the most with you, or remember that if you want to play with friends in the same kingdom, you do have to be in the same faction. You can change faction afterwards for 99 cents in the rune shop. Leveling up in Orna is an absolute grind. Switching your priority from world farming, dungeons, boss dungeons, raids, PvP, etc, etc. Playing with friends. It's a great way to mix it up and avoid burnout. Take a break every now and then if you need to. The grind is real, but the rewards and friends we make along the way are so great. Dual wielding weapons causes each of their stats to be lowered to 65% of their initial power. Now dual wielding two weapons of similar power can often yield greater offensive stats than with a dedicated offhand. Basic Kingdom Mechanics Members kill stuff to gain small amounts of Kingdom Gold which builds up over time. Kingdom Gold is then used to start Kingdom Gauntlets and Kingdom Wars, both of which yield Kingdom Orns when successful. Kingdom Orns are then used to start Kingdom Raids, and that's the source of all the loot and all the gear that we all want. How do you move in Orna? Well, it's a GPS game by the way, so you actually have to move about in real life. Walk, cycle, or catch a ride on public transport, or as a passenger in a moving vehicle, it's not mandatory to play the game, especially now that way vessels are here. It's made it much more accessible for people who cannot move around easily. But there are definitely advantages if you can move around regularly. The regional leaderboard and also your regional chat are sections of the world map split into 10 by 10 degree lat long regions. If you want to increase your rank and climb the leaderboards, the most efficient way to do so, alongside leveling up of course, is by completing boss dungeons and as many quests as possible. Alright folks, hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Ciao!